Tips, Tricks, and Techniques, with Mike Carl. Hi, welcome to our Tips, Tricks, and Techniques video. These are the things we cover in our sessions fortnightly. We would really love to see you live, but if you can't make it, hopefully this video will help you. Cheers. Um, I was going to talk about the basics of Spark View, but to be honest, I think in this environment, it's probably better that um, you actually go have a look at the videos that I put together over summer. Um, there's about 11 videos at the moment, maybe 12, um, just showing you how to use Spark View step by step. So instead of going through it all again here, um, I suggest you go look at those videos and in your own leisure. Um, and th that way I can spend more time talking about some other stuff. One of the most common um, emails and phone calls I get is that someone's sensors aren't connecting to SparkView properly. Now, there's usually three reasons for this to happen. So I'm just going to go through those three reasons now for you. Probably the main reason why you can't connect your wireless sensors to SparkView is that you're not running the latest version of SparkView. So I'm just going to show you here to how you find out if you are or not. So you just come over to the main menu at the top here. Just select that. And we go down to About Spark View. So if I click on About Spark View, you'll see here what the version is. So always make sure that the latest version is the one that we have on our website. And that will save you so many problems. The next reason uh, is usually is that you haven't updated the firmware of your um, sensor. So make sure when this little screen that comes up here comes up on your screen, make sure you always press yes. So that way it'll always give you the, the that way the sensor will be completely up to date all the time and you won't have issues with it dropping out, etc. And when all else fails, Turn your device off and on. Usually um, when it's installed, there's the drivers get installed, but until you've actually turned your computer or your phone or your um, iPad off and on, um, they won't be recognised. So that's usually the third way, and it's kind of like a lot of the times that will work. Turning it off and on again. Have you tried turning it off and on again? Have you tried turning it off and on again? Have you tried turning it off and on again? Have you tried turning it off and on again? Have you tried um, turning it off and on again? Have you tried turning it off and on again? Digital microscopes and digital presentation. In this demonstration, a standalone digital microscope is used. The procedure is exactly the same for a digital eyepiece camera. This function is also the same for the camera on your laptop, tablet or smartphone. Multiple brands of digital microscopes and eyepieces will work with SparkView. The ones Cider House Tech distributes do not require any driver installation. They are plug and play. Other brands may require drivers to be installed manually onto the device prior to use with SparkView. Contact your supplier for the drivers if they didn't come with the equipment. Check that the digital microscope or eyepiece is compatible and installed on your computer before launching SparkView. Please be aware at the time of compiling this video, there are issues with Chromebooks and USB microscopes. Please contact us for more information if you have any issues. To access the digital microscope we must first select the sensor data button. As the digital microscope is already plugged in it appears in the middle column. Its name will vary by which brand of digital microscope you are using. Click on your device's name. Now select the image checkbox. You will observe that a new template has appeared in the templates column. Select the camera template. The microscope should automatically initialize. The image will appear on the screen. This example is of a male's face. To open the toolbox click on the camera icon.
Once the image is focused, we can press the capture button. Now we can begin to annotate the captured image. We can zoom into the image further, if required. First we will take measurements. It is possible to change the color of the ruler. Click to where you want to measure from. Then drag your cursor to the end of the required measurement. If a known measurement is available, such as a slide scale, we can calibrate the ruler. To calibrate the ruler, click on the box at the start of the line. This will open the ruler settings panel. Here we can enter the known values of the measurement. Now any future measurements, will be in the scale of the calibrated measurement. The draw button allows to highlight areas on the image. By selecting the annotations button we can label interest points on the image. You can position the pointer and text box, by clicking and dragging them with your cursor. Remember to screenshot the work page to save the annotations. Now, if you're having trouble with your um, wireless sensors, probably 9 times out of 10, uh, what I'm about to tell you fixes it straight away. And what that is, is just doing a hard reset on it. And basically, it's, it's the equivalent of turning your computer off and on. Sometimes little memory things and that sort of a, a store up in your um, devices, uh, or not your devices, your sensors. So therefore, basically, all we want to do is clear them and start from scratch. So to do that, grab your um, sensor, press down on your um, power button for 8 to 10 seconds. Um, you'll see all the lights will start flashing on and off crazily. And basically, that means you've hard reset it. So then when you go to use it again, it should work perfectly. If it doesn't, then we've, then you should probably contact us and then we'll, um, we'll either we'll, we'll get it fixed for you. Well, I had this great idea to um, show you how to use four sensors at once, but unfortunately it's pouring down here in Melbourne at the moment, so I'm going to film it. So my little assistants... Uh, refuse to go outside, so I'm going to have to use a different method. But I'll just show you what I was going to do to start with. Four senses, four dogs. My lab partners. Cat, Polly, Monkey, and Bear. The girls were fitted with their senses. Then. This happened. So, this happened. Okay, let's try again. This time getting the temperature of a turtle and fish pond at four separate points. We will place the senses apart from each other. Put that down. What was it they said about working with children and animals? I guess I'm right. Um, okay, so I'm just going to run a video that I created showing you how to use more than one sensor at a time. Use up to about six if you wanted to. Um, that's no issue at all. 
Uh, sometimes you can even use more, but six is kind of what you'll see on the one display anyway. So here it is using temperature sensors two at a time. We will now look at displaying two temperature sensors on the same page or display. First we need to select the sensor data screen. From here both sensors need to be paired individually. Please take note that both sensors have been selected. We will now select the graph template. As you can observe there are, by default, two plot areas. Both sets of data will appear on separate graphs. To combine both sensors on the one graph, we need to build a page. To do this we must select Build New Page. From the Build New Page display we will select a full page template. Then select the Graph option. From the toolbar we will select the Add Y Axis button. The new Y Axis will appear on the right hand side. Click on the left hand side Y Axis button and select the sensor. Repeat this for the Y axis on the right hand side. Now, press start to collect data. Once we have pressed stop we can begin to analyze the data collected from both sensors. To change the sensor for analysis, choose the color of the run in the run box. The patented smart cart is the ultimate tool for studying kinematics, dynamics, Newton's laws, and more. We've added built-in sensors that measure force, position, velocity, and acceleration. The versatile smart cart can collect measurements on or off a track and transmit the data wirelessly over Bluetooth. In essence, it is a wireless dynamics cart that combines all the necessary sensors, without requiring any additional hardware. When connected to a PASCO smart cart, the smart ballistic accessory can launch the projectile based on measurements made by the smart cart in either SparkView or PASCO capstone software. The smart cart vector display adds visual vectors to your smart cart for force, acceleration, or velocity. Connect to the smart cart's accessory port to visualize vectors in real time. The arrows light up proportional to the sensor reading and indicate both magnitude and positive or negative direction. The smart cart motor is a motor-driven wheel that attaches to the smart cart to make it go at a constant velocity, forwards or backwards. This accessory allows the smart cart to be suspended from a rod stand. Use the smart cart's force sensor to measure the force of an oscillating spring and mass. The smart cart can be mounted directly to a vertical rod or to a horizontal cross rod. How much physics can a smart cart do? Let us now find out from the guys from development, at PASCO. Hi, this is Brett Sackett with Pasco Scientific, and I'm here with... JJ Plank with Pasco Scientific. So JJ and I were talking about the smart cart, and we got to wondering, how much physics can you do with the smart cart? Well, Brett, there's a lot of physics we can do with the smart cart. So much physics that we can't talk about all of it today. However, we will show you some of what we think are the best applications, starting with some topics in kinematics in one dimension. That's right. All right, let's rock some physics with the smart card. Acceleration on an incline. And even free fall. Hey JJ, how about we do some dynamics? Newton's first law. Newton's second law. Newton's third law. JJ, has the smart cart done enough physics yet? Absolutely not. All right, let's do some work and energy. Work energy theorem. Hooke's law.
Lots of great work and energy applications. As a physicist, I love all forms of energy. But you know what I really love about the smart cart? Is that every smart cart is fully customizable. Some other great applications include topics in momentum. Elastic collisions. Inelastic collision. Explosions with equal masses. Explosions with unequal masses. You know, JJ, with a built-in force sensor, encoder wheel, accelerometer, and gyro, there's so many things you can do with a smart cart. Well, let's uh, take a look at some of those additional applications. Let's do that. Simple harmonic motion. Centripetal acceleration. Centripetal force. So the smart car obviously makes a great tool in the student lab environment, but it's also a very useful tool for demonstration purposes. We've taken a look at a lot of the applications for the smart card. Let's have a quick review. And with Pasco's five-year warranty, you're sure to never get a lemon. Thanks for watching. This is Brett and JJ with Pasco Scientific. We've shown you a lot of things that you should absolutely do with the smart card in your classroom. So we're going to leave you with one thing you should definitely not do. <laughs> Another tip I've got for you guys is using spark fuels in oscilloscope. Um, you don't need to spend all that money on a, a standalone oscilloscope when you can use your device's inbuilt microphone. Um, this video here will show you how to do it easily. Spark view as an oscilloscope. In this instance, we will be using the onboard microphone. The scope display can also be used for the sound and voltage sensors. To access the oscilloscope function, select sensor data. Now turn on the onboard microphone. Ensure sound intensity is selected, as you can sample it at a much faster sample rate. Choose the scope option from the quick start experiments. I can tell that I'm in the scope mode because the icon at the lower left hand side is going to be that of the oscilloscope display. Let us examine the toolbar. Scale to fit. Toggle move or select mode. Add coordinates tool. Add annotation. Increase data points. Reduce data points. Positive trigger. Negative trigger. Settings. Next I'm going to get ready to select data. I'm going to turn off my sound so you don't have to listen to me whistle. As you can see the trace was hard to follow. So what we're going to do now cause I'm going to set a trigger. I can do that by selecting the icon at the lower left hand side and selecting the arrow pointing up to the line. That will show the trigger on the scope display. I'm going to displace slightly from zero. So that it will only trigger when the sound intensity gets above that level. If you wish to preserve the trace on the scope go ahead and stop data collection while the sound's been played. So that will also lock the display in place. The trigger can also lock the display in place until the trigger is exceeded again. Stopping data collection will then preserve the trace, at which point you can perform data analysis on it, including the use of the smart cursor to determine the frequency through the period.
This video from Pasco explains how to calibrate your pH sensors using SparkView version 4.4 onwards. If you have wireless pH sensors, you should not have to preform this calibration very often, as the sensor saves the calibration to its inbuilt memory. This is a video showing how to calibrate a pH sensor within SparkView 4.0 and beyond. I've previously paired a pH sensor to my occurrence of SparkView. I'm now going to remove my pH electrode from its storage bottle and then briefly rinse the electrode and then pat dry briefly, very gently, with a paper towel to remove any of the excess water. I'm going to access my calibration menu by selecting on the hardware setup menu and then selecting the crosshairs to the left of the gear on the line with the pH. I can see that I'm going to be calibrating my pH sensor, and I see that I've got the two-point uh, method here, and I'll click on Continue. By default, the standard value that's listed first is a pH 4. That's actually the type of uh, pH buffer solution that I have. But if you wish to change it, you can highlight this and then place in a different value depending on what the buffer solution is that you have. Again, the buffer solution that I have is a 4 uh, buffer solution, so I'll enter that in there. Down below, you'll see an active sensor value that's read in millivolts from the sensor. I'm going to place my electrode into my buffer solution. You may have to uh, move the cap for the storage bottle up farther on uh, the pH electrode. Once it is immersed in the solution and wait for it to stabilize, it looks like it's done that pretty much here, I'll go ahead and click on Set Calibration. Now going to remove my electrode from my buffer solution, recap the solution so that it doesn't get spilled, and then I'm going to again rinse my pH electrode and then blot dry so that I don't dilute my second pH solution with the deionized water. Now going to immerse my electrode into the second solution. In this case, it's a pH 10 solution. Dunk that in there and wait for a moment here, and wait for it to stabilize. Again, this is the value in millivolts that's being read directly. We'll wait for it to stabilize. And once that's happened, we'll go ahead and scroll on down and hit Set Calibration. And I'll click OK. My pH electrode is now ready to be used. But before I place that into any solution I'm going to measure, I'm again going to rinse my electrode with deionized water and then I will blot it dry before usage so that I am not diluting the solutions that I will be measuring. Uh, next thing I want to look at is adding manual data. So for things where you don't have a sensor and things like that, this is a really cool feature. Um, so if you wanted to say do a momentum prac, and so you wanted to add your mass and then use your motion sensor for your velocity and things like that. But in this instance, I want to show you using a titration. Now, for those of you who don't have our new wireless drop counter, this one, um, this is the perfect way to do it, okay? So what we do is click on sensor data, and you'll notice that I've already paired my um, pH sensor. Okay, so now I've got table and graph, which is the middle one, and that's the one I'm going to choose. So I click on that one, and that gives me the option. So at the moment, it's time versus pH. Now, I want to change that. So time is not the issue here. I want volume. So I click on time, and then I use user entered. And from here, I create a data set. So I've got to give it a name. So let's just call it volume. And I'm going to measure this in mils. So ML. Oops. Mils. Okay. And I can just leave these other ones as they is. So just click OK. So now you can see it's volume and pH. So when I come down the bottom here, you'll see it's pH versus time again on my graph. I'm just going to change that to read back to user entered and volume, which I just created. Okay. So this is now ready to go. But first of all, what I'm going to do is just to save myself time later, because I know I'm going to do it in increments of 10 mils. I'm just going to type in here, 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50. Okay, now if I wanted to, 
um, I could have left them blank and then added them later. So if I say if I made a mistake and it was like actually I added 15 one thing, I could just change these figures as well. But this is kind of the way we do it. Okay, so now we're ready to go. So let's um, go to the prac. Okay, so now we're ready to do the prac. Okay, so I've just set this up here and it's got 50 mils in as the setup. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add... I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to press start on my software. And I'm just going to add 10 mils to our liquid here. Now what I'm going to do is press pause. And get ready. Now again, I'm going to add another 10 mils. And pre the Press the, um, press the tick button again. So you can see the readings are starting to come. I'm going to add another 10 mils. And press the tick again. Add another 10 mils. And again, press the tick. And add another 10 mils. So now we have 50 mils in there. And now press the tick. Now if we press stop, we now have our data that we've collected. Okay, so now we've got the data there. What we're going to do is open up our toolbox, and scale to fit. You can see there it fits perfectly. So that's a really easy way of doing a titration using manual um, entry. Um, and that manual entry can be worked for us so many other things. So keep that one in mind. Well, that's all I've got for today. Hopefully it was informative and helpful. If you've got any questions, please don't hesitate to email me or give me a buzz. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And I'll, um, I'll see you hopefully when the schools suddenly become open again and we're not sort of stuck in our own states. Thanks a lot and see you later, guys. Bye. Don't forget to subscribe to our social media platforms for the latest news, tutorials, products and promotions.